Chapter thirty six of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Against universal expectation, Marfinkin's wedding was a quiet one, no one being invited except a few neighboring landowners and the important personages in the town, about fifty guests in all. The young people were married in the village church on Sunday after morning service, and afterwards in the hall, which had been transformed for the occasion, a formal breakfast was served without any of the gaiety and excitement usual to such occasions. The servants were most disappointed, for their mistress had taken precautions against their drinking to excess, which made the whole affair seem dull to them. Marfinka's trousseau and her contributions to the household had already been taken across the Volga, the process having occupied a full week. She herself shone with the charm of a rose grown to perfection. In her face a new emotion was visible, which found expression now in amusing smile, now in a stray tear. Her face was shadowed with the consciousness of a new life, of a far-stretching future, with unknown duties, a new dignity, and a new happiness. Vikentiev wore an expression of modesty, almost of timidity, and was visibly affected. Raisky looked at the pretty bride with the emotions of a brother, but he had an impulse of terror when he noticed in her sheaf of orange blossom some faded blooms. They are from the bouquet that Vera gave me for my birthday she explained naively. Raisky pretended that withered flowers were a bad omen, and helped her to pick them out. When the time for their departure came, the bride had to be literally dragged sobbing from her aunt's breast, but her tears were tears of joy. Tatiana Markovna was pale, only maintaining her self-restraint with difficulty, and it was plain that she could only just stand as she looked out on the Volga after her departing child. Once at home again, she gave way to her tears. She knew that she possessed the almost undivided love of her other child, the passionate Vera, whose character had been ripened by bitter experience. Tushin stayed with a friend in the town for the wedding. Next day he came to Tatiana Markovna, accompanied by an architect, and they spent nearly a week over plans, going over the two houses, the gardens and the servants' quarters, making sketches, and talking of radical alterations in the spring. Everything of value, furniture, pictures, even the parquet flooring, had been taken out of the old house and stored partly in the new house, partly in outhouses and on the ground. Tatiana Markovna and Vera intended to go to Novoselova and later on to visit the Vikentievs. For the summer they were invited to be the guests of Anna Ivanovna, Tushin's sister, at Smoke. Tatiana Markovna had given no definite answer to the suggestion, saying that it must be as God wills. In any case, Tushin was making the necessary arrangements with the architect and intended to make extensive alterations in his house for the reception of the honored visitors. Raisky stayed in his rooms in the new house, but Leonti had returned to his own home for the time being, to return to Malinovka after the departure of Tatiana Markovna and Vera. He too had been invited by Tushin to smoke, but Leonti had answered with a sigh, Later in the winter, just now I am expecting, and had broken off to look out on to the road from Moscow. He was in fact expecting a letter from his wife in answer to one he had just written. Not long before, Yuliana Andreevna had written to their housekeeper and had asked her to send her winter cloak. She indicated the address but said not a word about her husband. Leonti dispatched the cloak himself, with a glowing letter in which he asked her to come, and spoke of his love and friendship. The poor man received no reply. Gradually he resumed his teaching, though he still betrayed his melancholy now and again during the lessons, 
and was apt to be absent-minded and unconscious of the behavior of his scholars who took pitiless advantage of his helplessness tushin had offered to look after malinovka during tatiana markovna's absence he called it his winter quarters and made a point of crossing the volga every week to give an eye to the house the farmyard and the servants to whom only vasilisa yegor the cook and the coachman accompanied their mistress to novoselova Jakob and Savelli were put especially at Tushin's disposition. Raisky proposed to leave a week after the wedding. Titnikinich was in the most melancholy plight of all. At any other time he would have followed Tatiana Markovna to the end of the world, but after the outbreak of gossip it would have been unsuitable to follow her for the moment, because it might have given colour to the talk about them which was half believed and already partly forgotten. Tatiana Markovna, however, said he might come at Christmas, and by that time perhaps circumstances would permit him to stay. In the meantime he accepted Tushin's invitation to be his guest at Smoke. The gossip about Vera had given ground to the universal expectation of her marriage with Tushin. Tatiana Markovna hoped that time would heal all her wounds, but she recognized that Vera's case stood in a category by itself, and that ordinary rules did not apply to it. No rumor reached Vera, who continued to see in Tushin the friend of long standing, who was all the dearer to her since he had stretched out to her his helping hand. In the last days before his departure, Raisky had gone through and sorted his sketches and notebooks, and had selected from his novel those pages which bore reference to Vera. In the last night that he spent under the roof of home, he decided to begin his plot then and there, and sat down to his writing table. He determined that one chapter at least should be written. When my passion is past, he told himself, when I no longer stand in the presence of these men, with their comedy and their tragedy, the picture will be clearer and in perspective. I already see the splendid form emerge fresh from the hand of its creator. I see my statue, whose majesty is undefiled by the common and the mean. He rose, walked up and down the room, and thought over the first chapter. After half an hour's meditation, he sat down and rested his head on his hands. Weariness invaded him, and as it was uncomfortable to doze in a sitting posture, he lay down on the sofa. Very soon he fell asleep, and there was a sound of regular breathing. When he woke, it was beginning to get light. He sprang up hastily and looked round in astonishment, as if he had seen something new and unexpected in his dreams. In my dream, even, I saw a statue, he said to himself. What does it mean? Is it an omen? He went to the table, read the introduction he had written, and sighed. What use do I make of my powers? he cried. Another year is gone. He angrily thrust the manuscript aside to look for a letter he had received a month ago from the sculptor Kirillov, and sat down at the table to answer it. In my sound and clear mind, dear Kirillov, I hasten to give you the first intimation of the new and unexpected perspective of my art and my activity. I write in answer to the letter in which you tell me that you are going to visit Italy and Rome. I am coming to St. Petersburg, so for God's sake wait for me and I will travel with you. Take me with you and have pity on a blind, insane individual who has only today had his eyes opened to his real calling. I have groped about in the darkness for a long time and have very nearly committed suicide, that is, let my talent perish. You discovered talent in my pictures, but instead of devoting myself solely to my brush, I have dabbed in music, in literature, have dissipated my energies. I meant to write a novel, and neither you nor anybody else prevented me, and told me that I am a sculptor, a classical artist. 
a venus of living marble is born of my imagination is it then my cue to introduce psychology into my pictures to describe manners and customs surely not my art is concerned with form and beauty for the novelist quite other qualities are required and years of labor are necessary i would spare neither time nor endeavor if i thought that my talent lay in my pen in any case i will keep my notes or perhaps no i must not deceive myself by harboring an uncertain hope i cannot accomplish what i have in mind with the pen the analysis of the complicated mechanism of human nature is contrary to my nature my gift is to comprehend beauty to model it in clear and lovely forms i shall keep those notes to remind me of what i have seen experienced and suffered if the art of sculpture fails me i will humiliate myself and seek out wherever he may be the man his name is mark volokov who first doubted the completion of my novel and will confess to him you are right right i am only half a man but until that time comes i will live and hope let us go to rome rome there dwells art not snobbishness and empty pastime there is work enjoyment life itself to our early meeting the house was early astir to bid raisky godspeed tushin and the young vikentievs had come marfinka a marvel of beauty amiability and shyness tatiana markovna looked sad but she pulled herself together and avoided sentiment stay with us she said reproachfully you do not even know yourself where you're going to rome grandmother what for to see the pope to be a sculptor what marfinka also begged him to stay vera did not add her voice to the request because she knew he would not stay she thought sorrowfully that his manifold talents had not developed so far to give the pleasure they should do to himself and others cousin she said if ever you grow weary of your existence abroad will you come back to glance at this place where you are now at last understood and loved certainly i will vera my heart has found a real home here grandmother marfinka and you are my dear family i shall never form new domestic ties you will always be present with me wherever i go but now do not seek to detain me my imagination drives me away and my head is whirling with ideas but in less than a year i shall have completed a statue of you in marble what about the novel she asked laughing when i am dead any one who has a fancy for them may examine my papers and will find material enough but my immediate intention is to represent your head and shoulders in marble before the year is out you will fall in love with somebody else and will not know which to choose as your model i may fall in love but i shall never love any one as i do you i will carve your statue in marble for you always stand vividly before my eyes that is certain he concluded emphatically as he caught her smiling glance certain again interrupted tatiana markovna i don't know what you are discussing there but i know that when you say certain boris it is safe to say that nothing will come of it raisky went up to tushin who was sitting in a corner silently watching the scene i hope ivan ivanovitch that what we all wish will be accomplished he said all of us boris pavlovitch do you think it will be accomplished i think so it could hardly be otherwise promise to let me know wherever i am because i wish to hold the marriage crown over vera's head at the ceremony i promise and i promise to come leonti took raisky on one side gave him a letter for yuliana andreevna and begged him to seek her out speak to her conscience he said if she agrees to return telegraph to me and i will travel to moscow to meet her raisky promised but advised him in the meantime to rest 
and to spend the winter with Tushin. The whole party surrounded the traveling carriage. Marfinka wept copiously, and Vikentiev had already provided her with no less than five handkerchiefs. When Raisky had taken his seat, he looked out once more and exchanged glances with Tatiana Markovna, with Vera, and with Tushin. The common experience and suffering of the six months, which had drawn them so closely together, passed before his vision with the rapidity, the varying tone and color, and the vagueness of a dream. End of chapter 36「Chapter thirty seven of the Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. As soon as Raisky reached St. Petersburg, he hurried off to find Kirillov. He felt an impulse to touch his friend to assure himself that Kirillov really stood before him and that he had not started on the journey without him. He repeated to him his ardent confidence that his artistic future lay in sculpture. "'What new fancy is this?' asked Kirillov, frowning and painly expressing his mistrust. "'When I got your letter, I thought you were mad. You have one talent already. Why do you want to follow a side-track? Take your pencil, go to the academy and buy this,' he said, showing him a thick book of lithographed anatomical drawings. "'What do you want with sculpture?' it is too late i feel i have the right touch here he said rubbing his fingers one against the other whether you have the right touch or not it is too late why too late there is an ensign i know who wields the chisel with great success an ensign yes but you with your gray hair kirillov emphasized his remarks with a vigorous shake of the head raisky would wrangle with him no longer he spent three weeks in the studio of a sculptor and made acquaintance with the students there. At home he worked zealously, visited with the sculptor and his students the Isaac Cathedral, where he stood in admiration before the work of Vitali. And he spent many hours in the galleries of the Hermitage. Overwhelmed with enthusiasm, he urged Kirillov to start at once for Italy and Rome. He had not forgotten Leontis' commission and sought out Yuliana Andreevna in her lodgings. When he entered the corridor, he heard the strains of a waltz and, he thought, the voice of Kozlov's wife. He sent in his name and with it Leontis' letter. After a time, the servant, with an air of embarrassment, came to tell him that Yuliana Andreevna had gone with a party of friends to Tsarske Selo and would travel direct from there to Moscow. Raisky did not think it necessary to mention this incident to Leonti. His former guardian had sent him a considerable sum raised by the mortgage of his estate, and with this in hand he set out with Kirillov at the beginning of January for Dresden. He spent many hours of every day in the gallery and paid an occasional visit to the theatre. Raisky pressed his fellow traveller to go farther afield. He wanted to go to Holland, to England, to Paris. What should I do in England? asked Kirillov. There all the art treasures are in private galleries to which we have no access, and the public museums are not rich in great works of art. If you are determined to go, you must go by yourself from Holland. I will wait for you in Paris. Raisky agreed to this proposition. He only stayed a fortnight in England, however, and was very much impressed by the mighty sea of social life. Then he hastened back to his eager study of the rich art treasures of Paris. But he could not possess his soul in the confusion and noisy merriment in the incessant entertainments of Paris. In the early spring the friends crossed the Alps, even while he abandoned himself to the new impressions which nature, art, and a different race made on his mind, Raisky found that the dearest and nearest ties still connected him with Tatiana Markovna, Vera, and Marfinka. When he watched the towering crests of the waves at sea or the snow-clad mountain tops, 
his imagination brought before him his aunt's noble grey head her eyes looked at him from the portraits of velasquez and gerard dow just as murillo's women reminded him of vera and he recalled marfinka's charming face as he looked at the masterpieces of Goethe, or even at the women of raphael vera's form flitted before him on the mountain side he saw once more before him the precipice overlooking the narrow plain of the volga and fought over again the despairing struggle from which he had emerged in the flowery valleys vera beckoned to him under another aspect offering her hand with her affectionate smile so his memories followed him even as he contemplated the mighty figures of nature art and history as they were revealed in the mountains and the plains of italy he gave himself up to these varied emotions with a passionate absorption which shook the foundations of his physical strength in rome he established himself in a studio which he shared with kirillov and spent much of his time in visiting the museums and the monuments of antiquity sometimes he felt he had suddenly lost his appreciation of natural beauty and then he would shut himself up and work for days together another time he was absorbed in the crowded life of the city which appeared to him as a great crude moving picture in which the life of bygone centuries was reflected as in a mirror through all the manifestations of this rich and glowing existence he remained faithful to his own family and he was never more than a guest on the foreign soil in his leisure hours his thoughts were turned homewards he would have liked to absorb the eternal beauty of nature and art to saturate himself with the history revealed in the monuments of rome in order that he might take his spiritual and artistic gains back to malinovka the three figures of vera marfinka and his little mother tatiana markovna stretched out beckoning hands to him and calling him to herself with even greater insistence than these was another mightier figure the great mother russia herself end of chapter thirty seven end of the precipice by Ivan Goncharov. Translated by M. Bryant. Recorded by Tavarish.